Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at what happens in Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. So this is what we call the medieval period. Medieval means the Middle Ages. And the Middle Ages is another way of saying the medieval period. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly, it's also known as the Dark Ages. Now, if something's dark, it has to be dark in comparison to other things. If something is the middle, it has to be the middle in comparison to other things. The people who lived in this time period never thought of themselves as living in the Middle Ages or thought of themselves as living in the Dark Ages. Uh, but people afterwards have given that nickname looking back in reflection on this period maybe with some degree of realism, but also as a way of making their own time look better. Hey, we're not in the Middle Ages. We're the Advanced Ages. We're way better. We're not in the darkness. We're in the brilliant times, right? So <clears throat> the Western half of the Roman Empire falls in Western Europe and in Central Europe, and people become much more obsessed instead of being loyal to a government and an emperor. People are much more obsessed with basic survival. Um, the invaders that have come and wrecked Europe, like the Huns, have really done a number on European thinking and higher thought, and on survival even. So during this period, people are not interested in being loyal to an emperor 500 miles away. People are interested in getting together in small groups for protection, huddling together in tribes, trying to get through the hard times. <clears throat> um, the new civilization that grew up during the medieval period, during the early Middle Ages, based itself on some of the traditions of Rome, but also on the German tribes and the French tribes that were trying to survive, and also on this new religion that had come up uh, through Jesus Christ, the Christian church or the Catholic church. Today, there's more than one kind of Christian. Back then, there was only the original Christianity, the Catholic Christianity. Uh, a thing that had a big effect on the fall of Rome was that people could no longer stay together in cities. There wasn't enough food being grown around the city. There wasn't enough fresh water coming to cities. Do you remember? Do you remember what it is that brings fresh water to cities from the mountains? And they come down at a constant, slight downward angle from miles and miles from freshwater springs in the mountains down to Roman cities? Aqueducts, right? Yeah. <clears throat> now, nobody was keeping the aqueducts safe anymore because people were thinking about other things. People were trying to just survive and defend themselves from invaders. So people could no longer live in these big cities if there wasn't any uh, aqueducts anymore to make things work, to bring water into the cities. So very few people ever got an education after the fall of the Roman Empire. Education was not high on most people's lists. So the only people who learned how to read and write were priests and monks who eventually might become bishops and cardinals and popes, but people who worked in the church in an official capacity, saving people's souls, supposedly all learned to read and write. Many of the priests, though, weren't that good and didn't learn very thoroughly. And so <clears throat> mostly the only people who can read and write were in the church, and not even everybody in that capacity either. Um, but if you were the priest and you're in charge of your local church, you have to be able to save people's souls. And if you're going to save souls and bring people to heaven, then you need to be able to read the Bible so that you can teach people exactly what they need to get to heaven. And you can give lectures and sermons of what the Bible says. Now, the Bible was still only written in the original Roman language when it got spread out across the Christian world. Do you remember what the original Roman language was? That's right. Latin, right? So the Bible was in Latin. But 
other than the church, there was no real central government to get people in education. So while Latin was still the language of the church, it wasn't the language of the entire empire. Everybody broke up into their own local dialect, their own local language. <clears throat> Loyalty. You're no longer loyal to an emperor who lives 500 or 1,000 miles away. You're loyal just to the chief of your local tribe, the guy who has the warriors to protect you. So in the early Middle Ages, the early medieval period, uh, people's loyalty was to their local tribal chief. Laws? Not written down anywhere. The laws were just the traditional laws of your tribe, and your chief could change those laws and did a lot of the time. Um, warriors and their families would obey only the commands to fight for and save their chief, not for an emperor who lived many, many miles away that they'd never personally seen or spoken with. That's a big difference between the time of the Roman Empire and the Middle Ages. In France, there was a tribe that gave their name to the country, the Franks, and that's where we get the word France. The Franks grew strong under the control of a leader named Clovis. He defeated his enemies after he became a Christian in the year 496. He became a Christian so that he could unite his people more tightly under his own personal control. Because a lot of his people were Christian, and they wouldn't obey him if he wasn't one. So he changed. By the time he died in 511, he got the blessing of the leader of the entire Catholic Church. And, of course, we know the leader of the Catholic Church is the Pope, right? So he got the blessing of the Pope and had united all Christians in Western Europe under the Pope and his political control uh, into one kingdom, northern France. Christianity had been spreading. By around the year 600, all the tribes had joined. So northern and central and southern France came together. The church had created places for employees to go who dedicated themselves entirely to learning about God and communicating with God. These people are called monks, and the place that they live, monasteries. So the church made monasteries for monks to live in so they could get away from cities and towns and farms and live only with other people who were just as dedicated to studying God and communicating with God. Monks learned to read and write. There was one famous monk named St. Benedict who wrote a guidebook, a very strict guidebook, for how to be a monk and how to be a very effective monk, and uh, that's why he became a saint. And he actually is the founder of a group of monks who still believe in those rules, called Benedictine monks. Now, um, there was another great monk of this time period called the Venerable Bede. Bede was his name. Venerable means respectable. And the Venerable Bede was an author. He wrote a very comprehensive history of medieval England. Pope Gregory was the leader of the church around the year 590, and he changed the Catholic Church. He changed what the job of being Pope was like. Unlike past Popes, he spent his time not just studying religion and being a holy father to everyone. He was a warlord. He put together an army and controlled territory in the name of God. He took political and military power away from a lot of the kings in Europe. He made himself a king instead of being just a purely religious leader. We call things that are in this life that we deal with every day and not at all related to God or the afterlife or spirituality, secular things. And so Pope Gregory was Pope, which meant he needed to focus on religious things, but he also added a focus on secular things like military power and politics and money secular things, not having anything to do with the afterlife or God. The Franks produced more great leaders who fought for Christianity. 
The next one after Clovis was a man named Charles Martel. Martel means hammer. So this is Charles the Hammer. And who was he the hammer of? Well, he took charge in the year 719, and in the battle of 730, uh, and in the year 732, he fought a very famous battle called the Battle of Tours, T-O-U-R-S. And at the Battle of Tours, he stopped a Muslim invading army. This new religion, Islam, and the people who practice it, Muslims, had been growing in the Middle East, all across North Africa, and they invaded into Spain. And from Spain, they decided they were going to come north into Christian Europe and attack southern France. And that's when Charles Martel decided he needed to put together an army to save Christianity from this Muslim invasion. He fought the Battle of Tours in 732. It was a huge victory. It was really, really important because that's as far as the Muslims got in trying to invade mainland Europe from the west. After that, they retreated. Uh, the battle took several days. It wasn't even just a one-day battle. It was multiple days. And by the end of it, the Muslim leader had been killed in battle, and his forces were disorganized and demoralized, and so they retreated. Um, <clears throat> Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, started a dynasty. Now, Charles in Latin is Carol, C-A-R-O-L. And the dynasty, do you know what a dynasty is? A dynasty is when a person who's in charge of a country as a king passes power to their children, and then their children pass it on to their children, all in one family tree. When the royal power of a country is all kept within that one family tree, that family is a dynasty. And then eventually, probably after 100 years, 200, maybe 500 years, something is going to happen where that royal family is driven out and another family comes in and takes power. And if they choose to be royals and pass it on from father to son, usually, it's pretty sexist, then that's a new dynasty. So this dynasty started by Charles, Charles the Hammer, Charles Martel, is the Carolingian dynasty. Carol, because Charles in Latin. So, Carolingian dynasty was started with Charles Martel. He passed on power to his son, Pepin, known as Pepin the Short, not a very tall person. Even back then, uh, when most people were pretty short from malnutrition, I think the average height during this time period for guys was somewhere around 5'3". So they weren't getting the nutrients they needed as children. They weren't growing very tall. So Pepin the Short must have been a pretty short dude to be known by other people who were like five foot two, five foot three, as, hey, he's the king and he's pretty short, right? So um, Pepin saved the Pope in Rome from a rebellion, which is something that future Carolingian rulers will also do. They'll support the Pope. And most famously, the one who did it was Charlemagne, C-H-R-L-E-M-A-G-N-E, -E, Charlemagne. Charlemagne was hugely tall at a time when everyone was super short. He was, um, trying to remember, probably somewhere around six foot three or six foot four, when the average male height, again, was probably only five three. So Charlemagne towered over everyone. He was incredibly strong. He was a warrior king and a very important leader in Europe. Charlemagne took control in the year 771. Uh, he was a great leader. He reconquered a lot of the territory that had been Rome, but split up and went its own way. He brought it back together. He tried to recreate the Roman Empire under his own control. And he had done that pretty much by the year 800. And in that very year, in the year 800, the Pope, a Pope named Leo, the lion, right? This Pope Leo had been kidnapped in a rebellion. And these warlords weren't willing to let the Pope have the same kind of power that Popes used to have. But Charlemagne wanted to be loyal to the Pope and knew that if he was, he might get rewarded. So Charlemagne took an army of his Frankish soldiers and invaded Italy and found the Pope and set him free. 
and on Christmas Day of the year 800, the Pope rewarded him. Instead of just being King Charlemagne of the Franks, the Pope crowned him Holy Roman Emperor. Now, the funny thing is, it wasn't really an empire, and it wasn't really Roman, and in many ways it grew up to definitely not be very holy. But uh, this is the first modern time since Rome that anyone is a Roman emperor, a holy Roman emperor. Um, Charlemagne focused on keeping direct control over all the territories in his empire. He weakened the nobles who were from every region of the empire and replaced them with people who were loyal to himself. And it, every county across Europe had a new ruler called a count. The count is in charge of a county. And so uh, these men were all loyal directly to Charlemagne. They weren't local in the place that they had been sent to. This is something that a lot of historical rulers are going to do in order to consolidate power for themselves. They're going to kick out the local lords and replace them with people who are personally known and loyal to the emperor. So this is a great example of one of the rulers doing that. Charlemagne made counts and put them in power all over Europe, over all the counties. He also focused on bringing back education like they'd had in ancient Rome for rich children. And so he had a school made for his own royal court. All the people around the king are the royal court. And he had schools set up for the children of his nobles and the children of his counts. He himself even learned to read. And we know that he was working on learning to write at the time that he died because he had a workbook that he had tried writing in. So he was working on an education for himself, which is kind of cool. Um, also, interestingly, he really, really liked women. And uh, even though he was Christian, the Christian church at this time was not advertising that guys had to only have one wife. They could pretty much have as many women as they could afford to keep. And so Charlemagne had a lot of wives. When he died, his son Louis took charge. And after Louis's death, he'd had three children. And those three kids fought it out. They tried to divide the empire amongst each other. And there was one who took over France and northern Spain. There was one who took over Germany and northern Italy. And there was one who was stuck in the middle with like the Netherlands and Belgium and Switzerland and like Monaco in France and um, just these, these regions that have gone forever since back and forth and back and forth whenever invaders want to go from one European superpower to another. It happens a lot. So this middle brother being stuck in between his two brothers who invaded him all the time and messed around with him, uh, that territory, because they split it in three that way, that territory has ever since been a battleground for the rest of Europe. And that is the end of Chapter 13, Section 1. So the next time we get together, we're going to take a look at invaders in Europe and a big reason why it's called the Dark Ages, because there was no security, no peace. They were constantly being hammered by enemies, and you never knew if you were going to survive after breakfast to get to lunch or to have supper. You never knew if you are going to survive to the next day. So, the medieval period. We'll get to more of it next time. Thanks.